So what I want to talk today about is focus on health equity and the role of health services research. And in my talk, um, obviously first I want to remind you who we are and the organization I run. And oh my gosh, Woody's here. Hi Woody. Sorry, just recognized a familiar face. Dr. Kessel and I worked together at HHS for a number of years. Um, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll show you what else I'm going to talk about. But how many of you have heard of Academy Health? Okay, great. That's, that's right. It's, it's a, a, a greater proportion. Some of my talks are, um, you know, fewer folks know about it so that I'm, I'm already one step ahead. But you probably don't know all that we do to support our mission. And our mission is very much like, like my career, focused at that intersection of producing evidence and getting evidence used to make health and healthcare better. And over the years I've been at Academy Health, the last five years, while the mission has been constant pretty much for the last 30 years, I think where we've seen an emphasis grow is on health as opposed to healthcare, as more and more of us focus on population health and social determinants, um, and also uh, a shift a little bit from a, a primary focus on federal policy and practice to also state policy since the Affordable Care Act and so much is happening at the state level and certainly Maryland is a state where a lot of exciting stuff is happening and that's a term of art, right? Stuff. So <laughs> lots of great initiatives. So what do we do at Academy Health? These are our goals but it's really about building a community that works together to achieve the mission. And I'm going to tell you about some of our specific initiatives that relate to health equity and how we're really trying to infuse a focus on health equity throughout all the work that we do at Academy Health. I'm actually going to yeah, maybe turn here, there. right, so I, I, I'm not doing quite the ping pong so much. Um, and so here, I, I'm not going to detail this circle, but it's the graphic that we use that exemplifies the work we, that we do. Around, and if you look at the outer circle, it's about helping to produce the evidence um, and to translate it and disseminate it and, and help prioritize it. It's really what we like to call the research life cycle. That it's, it's constant, but you have to think about all phases at each phase. If you're just thinking about dissemination when you've completed your research project, you've missed the boat. You need to be thinking about dissemination and audiences and, and impact and application from the get-go. So what I want to focus on today is I'm going to kind of ground us in the definitions we use about what the, when we talk about health services research and health equity. And then give you a very brief snapshot of sort of the world according to Lisa. Where do we stand on health equity and health disparities? And then focus in on some opportunities going forward. So first, some definitions. This is the definition of health services research from our website. And even in good days when my lung capacity is at 100%, I can't get this out in one breath. Which, if you're working with policymakers, you know that's a problem because you've got you know, an elevator ride or a cafeteria line length of time to tell them why you're there and what you want them to know. But so when I talk about health services research, what I really talk about is this kind of definition. It's all about understanding what works to improve health and health care, not just in general, but for whom, for which communities, for which populations. As a pediatrician, you know, it's all, the adult answers don't fit. So it kind of comes naturally for those of us who've worked with children to know that you have to understand the population of interest and the context in which care or systems or community interventions are provided are critical to effectiveness. And then obviously at what cost? And once you've answered those questions, increasingly health services research is now also focusing on what some of us call scale and spread. How do you sustain it? How do you implement it more broadly? How do you take it to different contexts and apply it with uh, fidelity and adaptation? So in terms of definitions of equity and disparity, um, here are two. The first one is from the National Partnership for Action to End Health Disparities, and the second is from the law establishing the National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities. And you'll see that, again, the first one in equity, and there's much more, I think, uh, just personally, I see much more emphasis on equity in our language, in our studies, in our policy discourse today than even five years ago, um, where there was much more focus on disparities. And, um, but here, disparity is very much codified in legislation in the establishment of the National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities and talks about difference as opposed to sort of optimal, optimizing outcomes, optimizing health. Um, so I think we, they're both, they're different and they're both important and we need to keep focused on both of those. 
And I didn't do this because the author of it is in the room. I actually use the slide a lot um, in my talks on equity. So this is part of my standard slide deck whenever I talked about equity. Take a photo. Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> Um, but it, it, I think, speaks very much to where I think the field ha has been and needs to be in terms of the generations of disparities or equity research, moving us from detection, understanding, to providing solutions and taking action. And I'm going to come back to this in, later in my talk. So those are some definitions. So now, where, where are we today in this country on health equity and disparities? So um, there. Some of you, how many of you have heard of the Heckler Report? Okay, so anybody with one gray hair and some younger folks have heard of the Heckler Report. But um, this last year, uh, 2015, was the 30th anniversary of the release of this report, which was really called Black and Minority Health Report of the Secretary's Task Force. But the colloquial term is the Heckler Report because it was the first national report that really brought together the evidence that we had disparities in this country that were associated with race and ethnicity. And um, we had a special session at the annual research meeting in Minneapolis last uh, June on the Heckler Report. We were very honored to not just have Na Dr. Nadine Garcia from the Office of Minority Health speaking, but actually Dr. Sullivan came and spoke as well. So it was a fantastic session. Um, personally, I'm a little disappointed that HHS didn't put out a 30th year sort of report, a look back to say where, because then I could have used all their slides. You know, I would have had easy resource. But I think that that would be an incredible sort of national contribution for, for, the, for the department to actually look at where we've made progress and where we have not. So I've gone to some other sources. So this is from the AHRQ's National Healthcare and Quality and Disparities Reports. How many of you have glanced at those reports or their website? Okay, so some of you are familiar. If you're not, it's a great resource. They have some nice chart packs. They have other resources. And I've just pulled out a couple of slides. And I think there's a small enough room that I'm going to walk over there um, and lose that mic, but I'm still being recorded. You can still hear me at the back, right? Great. So what the, these slides are a little complicated to explain, but the important message here is this is 2012 data, the most recent available in that report, in this report, which shows that where for each of these, the, the vulnerable or disparate disparity population is compared to the reference population. So in other words, poor versus high income, black versus white, Hispanic versus white, Asian, and uh, Native American, uh, Alaska Natives, American uh, Indian uh, <coughs> versus white. And so blue means that the, that quality measure is the same. So blue is no disparity between those, those groups, the population and, and the disparity, the reference group and the disparity. Green is where the, it's worse. So there is an outcome, a quality measure that where the um, vulnerable or disparity population has poor quality. And so you can see it's 62 measures when you look at poor versus high income. And importantly, that's where we see the most disparity is by income. And I think, again, in this country, so much of disparity and equity we confound and our history has led to so much co you know, confusion between race, ethnicity, and income. And they're both really fundamental dimensions of equity and disparity that we have to better understand. And we as researchers really have to keep focused on that as we think about how we construct our research studies to not confuse the evidence base further and really start to try to tease out. Because if we have the right evidence that points to the real drivers, that's how we can mount interventions that really tackle the key structural and systemic causes of these disparities. So here, that's just a snapshot in time. The next slide is about improvement. Where are we seeing change? So again, blue is no change. So this is over time in the disparities report. Not much change. That's the key message. Despite all this effort in healthcare transformation, in quality improvement, we don't see a whole lot of change in performance of the healthcare system from these major uh, reports. We see, we see some improvements. That's the black. It's kind of weird what colors they pick. This is ARC's slide. Um, but uh, I, I'd like to sort of have these kind of um, be pop out more. And green is where we actually see worsening. And importantly, again, the message here, the dimensions where worsening is happening most often is poor versus high income. And again, in the context of the growing income inequality in this country, 
you know, I, I sort of interpret this as this is another signal underscoring that issue in America. Now, I'm a pediatrician, I'm a child health services researcher. Yes? Can I ask a question? Please, makes it much more fun. Yeah, no, I was just wondering what is the, the N? The N is the number of, quali of measures in the report. So of 98 measures, where compared where the sample is large enough from NHIS, MEPS, these are all national data sets in these reports, poor versus high income populations, and high income is defined as greater than 400% federal poverty level. Um, 76 of the measures, there's no change, no improvement in, in the disparity, and this was the one with the highest number of disparities. So this is the number of measures, that's the percent of measures. Thank you for asking that clarifying question, yes. So when you say, you know, the, the disparity is still very wide, have they, overall in other words are the whites uh, you know living longer and so those who are poor are living like you know so has the is there an the oh, is there an overall trend upward yeah. so um, yes and no I would That's point out and I, I'm, I want to make that point, so thank you for raising that because that's an important dimension of equity and disparity. But I want to speak to, to your question, uh, to your comment about, by pointing to Case and Deacon's work about white mortality because the CDC and others have recently talked about how black-white mortality is, uh, the disparity is um, uh, lessening from in some met uh, the mortality from two a twofold difference to about 1.5 over a course of about 20 years. There's some great slides. The challenge is, and what's hidden in that by fo focusing on the change in the relative difference, is that is not because black mortality is improving. It's because white mortality is getting lower. Okay, and so their case and cases work and others is focusing in on what they call the diseases of despair over the last 20 years. Com when you compare America to other um, industrialized nations in Eastern Europe, you know, in, in Europe and Australia, et cetera, um, we're the only country where we're seeing um, white mortality drop over the last 20 years, whereas their mortality is, uh, sorry, increase, get worse, and theirs is continuing to drop. So our trend in America has changed. Now, you can't look at the white mortality without looking at, okay, so what about black mortality? Well, it's still really bad as well compared to these other European nations. But So we're seeing a narrowing, at least in the mortality indicator, between blacks and whites, but it's because whites are dying more. Then you have to break it down by why, addiction versus And there's all those that are part of this, absolutely. And in fact, for if you're interested in these international comparisons, the IOM report on shorter lives, poorer health, is really a key document, and I think it's page 43, or 63, the, the graphic that really spoke to me was looking at the survival expectation for women in their 50s in America versus other countries. And this is supposedly the most advantaged group, white women in America of a certain income, I think, and our mortalities dropped way down off the charts compared to Europeans. So there's a lot going on in terms of social status, income, and outcomes that um, is really complex. And I can't cover all, <laughs> most of it today. So I'm just skimming the surface here, I recognize that these are really interesting points. So focusing in more specifically on children, Denise Doherty and her colleagues t looked at the, these National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Report and drilled down and, and looked at the 56 measures over four years. And actually here, children seem to be doing better overall because you see improving, 23 are moving in the right direction, 29 have no change and only four are worsening. So in terms of the relative number of measures that are getting better, it's higher for children than for other populations. So that's at least positive. Um, but again, um, if you then drill down a little bit and look at who, for who is it getting better, for the poor, there's improvement for Hispanics and for publicly insured, but on other measures, Hispanic and high middle income are getting worse. What you see basically for black children, and I'll, I'm sort of pre previewing a, a slide a couple down the way, is that um, actually black children are no change or getting worse in general in this country. So here, oh gosh, the colors don't show up really well. This is from, we do an annual report on healthcare for children every year in this country where we use MAPS and HCUP data, both ARC data sets. And this is our report from 2013, which looked at trends using the most recently available data from 2002 to 2009, comparing trends on a whole bunch of measures. I'm just including a couple to show here. 
um, and that you see that for Hispanics, the uninsured rate has dropped from the about 15 to 10. So significant improvement, 50% reduction. Um, you know, CHIP, the Child Health Insurance Program, has been around for a while. A lot of emphasis on not just outreach but retention, which is a huge issue in keeping children enrolled in public programs. Um, but either no change, um, mainly no change for the other populations. If you look at usual source of care, another standard sort of indicator of access to care for, for children, a um, lot of data here. The top line is the important one, Hispanic. Again, you see an improvement of 82% of children having a usual source of care going up to 87%. That was significant for every other population, every other cut of disparity dimension, no change. So again, some improvements for Hispanics, no change or getting worse on a number of different indicators for other populations. And you see for the blacks non-Hispanic, it's, it's not significant at the 0.05 level, but you see a downward trend there between those two point estimates. Um, so, and then, um, so again, uh, for Latino children, some improvements, usual source of care have not changed for most except for Latinos, and um, some improvements in use of annual visits, uh, except for black children, and at the same time, even though children are cheap, that's what everybody says, nobody focuses on children in policy because they're cheap, um, we still see a 48% increase in the cost of care for children. So a relative significant increase. And one of the other, if you use the MCH Data Resource Center and the work that um, Christy Bethel at Hopkins and her colleagues have done through that for the Bureau, um, a lot of emphasis on chronic illness in children and youth, particularly uh, behavioral health conditions. Um, and so a lot, a lot of those issues happening in, um, which may be contributing to costs. And then to the geographic disparity quest, uh, point, this is a one um, slide from an article we published in Pediatrics in 2009 on what we called, um, the title was Consistently Inconsistent. In other words, disparities and disparities where to set this up for you, again, we looked at, we dichotomized a disparity dimension for obesity. This one's by income. So here is the percent overweight or obese in the population greater than 400% of the federal poverty level. So this is the high in, highest income grouping. And here is less than 100% federal poverty level. And so then we looked at where do the states, each dot here is a different state. And we, the symbols are by quartile. So the squares are the lowest quartile, et cetera. And so if you look at the states, you know, you see, wow, Wisconsin and Delaware have some very high um, rates of overweight and obesity in the low-income population. In fact, the ratio in Wisconsin of overweight and obesity among low-income versus high-income is three to one, okay? You switch down here to Louisiana, the ratio is one to one. The, and that's not a great thing. It means more high-income kids are overweight and obese. And so this is really, and people say, oh, but you're not adjusting for differences and all these other sort of covariates and confounders, and clearly those are important. But when you're a state policymaker, you need to know what your population is experiencing. And by looking at it this way, it helps inform, if I'm in Louisiana and I want to do a targeted obesity prevention intervention, I got to deal with all populations. Whereas if I'm in Wisconsin, I'm much more worried about my low income population and might want to mount strategies through the low income sort of frame to really target and reach those children most at risk. So again, thinking about the geography and the disparities and disparities and the old adage that I'm sure many of you have heard before, which is geography is destiny in this country. Or, you know, your zip code is more important than your genetic code. So there are lots of, you know, clip, quips that we have but very important to understand the geographic dimensions of disparities. So in conclusion, it's sort of where do we stand now? The reality is by 2050, people of color in this country will be the majority. And in fact, um, more than half of US cities are now majority minority. The 2011 birth cohort nationally was the first majority minority birth cohort. And as of 2010, more than 50% of children under age five were white just about 50%. In contrast, the oldest age group was 85% white. And so this difference in the makeup, the racial and ethnic makeup of our country is really important to focus on. And us, those of us in child health have been focused on it for a while, but clearly I think it, it's, um, it sets the backdrop for a whole lot of other public health issues. And 
politics and policy and you know, our election and all kinds of things in terms of who votes, et cetera. So um, the reality is that, again, people of color will be the majority in the US. And so we have to even stop thinking the way we've been thinking if we're really going to eliminate disparities and equity and achieve equity. So what's health services research trying to do to try to help this and move this forward? I'm just going to focus on a few um, opportunities. Um, the point, back to Dr. Thomas's about um, interventions. We, I think we need to move to, towards more interventions. Testing, not just describing and understanding, but trying to do something about disparities and eliminating them. We need to, and, and in doing so, I think we also have the opportunity to leverage some new data streams, which I'm going to mention. We need to build communities of learning. I think we have to focus on the diversity of the workforce itself that's doing research. I think that's critical. And um, of course, I run an organization that's a membership organization, so there'll be my little pitch at the end about getting involved. So first, let's uh, focus on um, moving towards more intervention research. We partnered with the AAMC, the, American, the Association of American Medical Colleges, a couple years ago, a couple of our staff, to do an analysis of HSR Praj. How many of you have ever heard of HSR Praj? OK, a couple. That's great, because it's sort of an unknown gem resource. But this is a database that the National Library of Medicine maintains, and we do it under contract with them. And it's a comprehensive collection of health services research, and not just federal. So if you're used to going to NIH Reporter to find out who's doing what research or what's been funded, that only has federal research. This has 149 different organizations, including private sector foundations, et cetera. So it's the most comprehensive. It's only health services research using a standard definition instead of mesh terms to identify and populate. And so the team did an analysis looking at the distribution where they classified the studies based on you know, uh, expert input, which ones were detecting disparities, which ones were primarily focused on understanding, and which ones were reducing or eliminating. And again, when I transferred this graph, the, the blue didn't show up so well. But the bottom line is that from 2007 to 2011, the number of studies look, looking to reduce or eliminate disparities went from 27% of the portfolio to 52%. Um, and so that's actually a 93% increase in solutions-focused research over the last five years. So I think that's very positive. Um, we're going to need to update this in, um, you know, in a couple years when we have the, tw we're all, we always lag a couple years behind in the data set, so that's pretty typical. But I think we are moving towards more intervention research. When you look at what was in the data set, the vast majority were healthcare delivery studies focused as opposed to maybe disease-specific studies. Um, so then the question is, well, how good is this research? So I looked at a couple sources. And um, so one was an ARC evidence report that they published in 2013 that looked at quality improvement research to address health disparities. And you can see the numbers here. Uh, typical of all the evidence reports, thousands of abstracts are identified. It's whittled down to a very small number of studies that are qualified to be included. 11 of the, four, of the um, <coughs> 19 papers were randomized controlled trials. And 18 incorporated multiple components. 12 of those uh, were patient education. 12 had patient education. And what did the authors conclude? that QI has not been shown specifically to reduce known disparities in health care or health outcomes. And so the question is, does QI not work? Or are they doing the wrong QI? You know, what's, what's going on? But I think that's sort of the state of the science now. And you know, you're probably thinking, well, most disparities are due to factors outside the control of the healthcare system. Of course, QI would not help. You're right. However, healthcare systems are increasingly held accountable for the outcomes of their population. And so there's a very important lever to try to at least get health systems focusing more externally. And again, in Maryland, uh, Dr. Thomas and I were just briefly talking about the global budgets for hospitals. Now the incentives are aligned that the funds flow for care to services is now linked to outcomes that are driven outside or upstream from the care system. And so how can we leverage that to really address equity and disparities? So to give you an example from one of the uh, articles, ge the Generalized 
and provider-directed QI efforts using clinical decision support and provider feedback can lead to reductions, especially in the areas of preventive and chronic disease, but will not be sufficient to achieve healthcare equity. So, so we know that. And in fact, in another review, um, oh, it's coming up. So uh, another important article said that uh, by Lyon and Raphael last year, that one of the important things is to partner health disparities research with QI science. So bring sort of two disciplines and approaches to research together to really tackle this issue of promoting health equity and health dis and eliminating health disparities. And so they um, stated that QI interventions need to overcome well-described challenges in developing, implementing, and studying QI in vulnerable populations and under-resourced settings, and they outline a, a number of recommendations that studies and researchers could uh, think about in the design of their studies going forward and in the, their interventions. So I think those are quite helpful. Um, and again, speak to the broader upstream determinants, social determinants of health. And they uh, conclude, ultimately, new partnerships between communities, providers, serving vulnerable populations, and researchers will be required for these interventions to achieve their potential related healthcare disparity elimination or reduction. In another review article by Clark, and some of you are familiar with the website Finding Answers, Marshall Chin's initiative, funded by RWJ. So it's a great website. That initiative was a 10-year initiative funded by the Robert John Johnson Foundation called Finding Answers to, and I, it's just called Finding Answers, but there's a more to it about health disparities. And it's, it's a really good set of resources. While the initiative has ended, the website still is up, and there's a lot of resources. And I, um, Marshall was on our board for a while. He's, a for, he's an internal medicine researcher, QI and disparities researcher. So this article summarizes, you can see, a number of intervention research on disparities and found that the most common strategies were education and training and the least common were financial incentives. And that 50% of the interventions targeted the patients or the community members. So what does this raise for you? Like, we're trying to get the patients, the people experiencing the disparity, to fix themselves, right? As opposed to looking at the systems, like how do you change the systems, the incentives, the structures and the supports that are producing the disparity and the inequity. Um, and so I think it's, it's a frame shift. If we're really gonna move intervention research forward, we've gotta think about what, what, what are we really talking about in terms of interventions here? Because, you know, it's, it's just ridiculous to expect patients to somehow change when we're not changing any of their context of the reality of their lives. Um, if you're looking for more information on um, uh, interventions that people have tried to address disparities, I would encourage you to look at the ARC Innovations Exchange website. You see it there. They have over 600 innovation profiles that are relevant to health disparities, to reducing disparities. Now these are not at the level of sort of evidence of effectiveness that you'd need for an EPC report or the US Preventive Services Task Force, that level of evidence, but they're well documented, they've been tried in at least one system, and they have some metrics of success. So rather than starting a new disparity intervention de novo, it's a great place to start to find out what have people tried and how successful have they been. Um, so then talking about intervention research and how do we do more of it, Obviously, we at Academy Health um, help to sort of create the academic and intellectual discourse for people who are doing research to learn from each other, to share methods, to sh share innovations. And while the annual research meeting that I'm going to mention in a minute is our jewel and our crown of our, our uh, organization, we also part started partnering <coughs> with the National Institute of Health across 17 different programs and institu institutes and centers on the conference on the science of dissemination and implementation in health. Have any of you attended this conference in the past? Well, you might want to consider. It's in December in Washington, so it's not far away. Um, and um, because it's a partnership with NIH, they do a lot of the work of developing the program, so the costs of producing the conference are much lower. And so um, the registration rates are more affordable than many. Um, they're in the sort of 350 range. So for a two-day conference, that's actually a pretty good rate. Um, but this past year, uh, in December, we had a, 
we organized by tracks, and one of the tracks was, as you see here, promoting health equity and eliminating disparities with 55 abstracts. And so 10% of the abstracts were specific to this theme, were submitted under this theme. That's not to say that the abstracts in the other themes didn't also have a disparity dimension. Um, and there was lots of great dialogue around, again, intervention, research, dissemination, implementation, research on disparities. This is the annual research meeting. Uh, again, I apologize for the colors. On the left, these are the years, the, the last five years from 2012 to 2016. Um, the first column is the number of disparities abstracts that were uh, submitted. And on the right is the total number of abstracts. So you see that we've always had disparities and health equity has been uh, an important focus. It's one of the top abstract getters, because we have 18 themes. If you're wondering, well, what are all the other abstracts in? Well, there's 18 of them. So this is much more than a proportional representation. It's what, uh, disparities is usually one of the top three in the number of abstracts submitted. So there's always a very robust set of uh, presentations around disparities. I would also just point out that in the last five years, you'll see that the total number of abstracts submitted has gone up by about 50%. Um, so there's a, a lot going on in health services research. It's very exciting. And this year, we had 2,564 abstracts, so the most ever submitted to the annual research meeting. Um, some, again, there are those in disparities, but there are many other tracks, uh, quality, quality disparities, lots of other tracks where disparity issues are discussed. So coming back to close on sort of focusing more on intervention research, um, this is where we, I think we really need to focus and where the field of health services research can contribute to policy and practices, identifying the interventions that actually are successful. And then we as a community have to do a much better job of spreading those. So people, because everybody's trying, I think really hard to try to address this, um, but they're not necessarily knowing what has not worked. It's just as important to know what failed and not try it as it is to know what did work. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we think about also addressing um, disparities, one of the ways that health services research I think has a real amazing opportunity is to leverage new data streams so that we're not just working off of the the tired old, very useful, but tired old Medicare and Medicaid claims data that our field has focused on for so many years, or national surveys, NHIS and, you know, and Haynes, all wonderful, incredible data sets, or BRFSS, et cetera. There's so much more out there now. So um, just to remind ourselves, uh, obviously electronic health records, most of them do not have REL data, race, ethnicity, language, but increasingly they do. And so, you know, how do we leverage those data for disparities research, not just documenting or understanding again, but actually mounting interventions. Um, the, the move towards portable and all kinds of innovations there. Uh, registries, we have not just the traditional immunization registries, but lots of different disease registries exist where, again, REL data is inconsistently, but in many, collected, so leveraging registries. Um, social networks, uh, if you haven't heard of C3N, it's a, it's an, a pediatric uh, national innovation bringing together parents of children with inflammatory bowel disease and providers and leveraging data across both patients, caregivers, and providers and connecting them through social networks and media uh, to improve inflammatory bowel disease. And, and my colleague who runs this, Peter Margolis, actually says, uh, you know, that the biologics often have a name that ends in AMAB. You know, it was something, something, I can't even think of. And he calls this the improve a map. So their focus on improvement has led to more remission free, you know, um, remission days, less flare ups and all that than any biologic ever has for these kids. So focusing on improvement and actually delivering on the promise of care is critical. Uh, patient reported outcome measurement systems. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Asmopolis. It's just one, it was an early app on the market where people could send in, again, sort of building in the sort of quantified self, the Fitbits and this whole movement towards every data point in your life exists somewhere. Uh, but Asmopolis uh, had people recording, um, they, they linked their ventilator to also their geographic data so they could um, connect where uh, environmental pollution data and asthma attack data and then they would feed it into the public health department so they could be leveraging both a surveillance type of framework with individual data collection to understand how to address uh, environmental uh, causes of asthma uh, outbreak, you know, uh, attacks. 
Um, but basically, we're in the era of big data, whatever that means. But health services research really has the opportunity to leverage a number of these. And so we have a number of activities at Academy Health. I won't go through these in details, but very importantly, just because we have this data doesn't mean it's turning into information or research or knowledge or helping us address anything, let alone address disparities. And so building communities of, communities of users who come together to tackle this is a big part of the work that we're doing. Um, also data governance, you can imagine people you know, want to know how is my data going to be protected and how is it shared amongst organizations. Um, and so one of the things that came out of some work that one of our projects worked on is this portable consent so that you can actually consent patients through Apple's uh, research kit. It was it picked up by Apple, so we were very pleased that work that we helped to sponsor and work on got picked up by a mainstream uh, app like that. So again, try and, and that should really help to also recruit in different communities and do that portable consent. We also have a journal called eGEMS, which was launched three years ago and uh, just came out with its special issue on governance. So lots of issues around how do you do governance of all these new data streams effectively. Um, and eGEMS also published, there was a special issue that we published um, about a year and a half ago in partnership with Frontiers in Public Health Services Research, PHSSR, all around data sources to um, understand and improve population health. So obviously, when you think about disparities and health equity and population health, you're not thinking just healthcare data, you're thinking all kinds of other data. And lots of innovation and uh, happening amongst our members and throughout in how do you link these data sets to better understand the communities that individuals live in and the resources they have or do not have access to and mount interventions to try to address disparities. So lots going on in this space. We also just launched last earlier this year the Community Health Peer Learning Program uh, funded by the Office of the National Coordinator. And this is specifically working with 10 geographic communities and five communities of experts, sort of subject matter expert communities, where each of the communities is um, trying to achieve population health objectives through expanded collection sharing and use of electronic health data. So it's kind of, if you heard about the Beacon program that ONC funded a number of years ago. We worked with that, Beacon Communities. This is kind of a follow-on project, but very focused on population health. And health equity and disparities is one of the dimensions that's integral to their work. So they're working with these communities to, again, how do they identify community-based data solutions, accelerate local progress, and then again share across the various communities, which leads me right into the importance of communities of learning. If anything, I've learned over the last I, don't, I won't say how many years of my career, right, Woody, we, we won't say. Um, it's just how big this country is and how diverse in every dimension of diversity that you want to think about. And so we, we're very good at reinventing the wheel. And so one strategy for, for accelerating progress and learning is these, this communities of learning model because peer learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning is a very successful adult education, you know, instructional design approach. So we have many communities of practice. The Electronic Data Methods Forum has two specific communities within the larger community. One is on population health community of practice, which is state and city health departments working together on, um, for example, New York City has been doing some very interesting work linking electronic health record data with, uh, from primary care sites, particularly safety net sites, with their surveillance data to help better understand the health needs of communities and neighborhoods in New York City. Um, there's some really interesting work going on in Louisiana um, that I won't go into. We also work with the Medicaid medical directors. Obviously, Medicaid serves a very vulnerable, low-income population, and racial and ethnic and other disparities are very prevalent in that population that they serve. And these are the senior doc in every Medicaid program. And so we are partnered with them and help them work on topics of interest they've for example, focused on early elective deliveries at one point and how learning from each other of how do we reduce these unnecessary less than 39 week deliveries. They've worked on reducing hospitalization, re-hospitalizations, readmissions. They've focused on uh, overuse of psychotropic meds in kids, again, behavioral health issues in the Medicaid population. And so um, lots of, of work with them. 
Um, the State University Partnership Learning Network is one we just launched two years ago, recognizing that state universities, gee, University of Maryland, are you guys, yeah, Hilltop is a member, um, have uh, work very closely with their state policymakers. And so we have a network of 22 um, of these partnerships with established relationships between their university and their state Medicaid program on helping the Medi Medicaid program do their analytics, evaluate their programs, et cetera. And our most recent network that we're just going to launch uh, next month is looking at low v value care and overuse of services that aren't, aren't effective. When we think about disparities, we tend to um, think particularly about patients who need a service not getting it, right? And that leading to poor outcomes. Um, but I always remember an article that Carolyn Clancy wrote, oh, probably 20 years ago, ago now, called Sex, Access, and Excess. And it was about gender disparities in cardiovascular care. And her point was, actually, maybe it's not that women need more interventions. Maybe men need fewer. So as you think about um, overuse, it can also cause harms. And so thinking about, again, how do you tease out these issues of overuse of ineffective and potentially harmful uh, services? This is the Electronic Data Methods Forum and um, the Population Health Community of Practice that I mentioned. If you're interested in hearing more about them, I'm happy to answer questions. A much more loosely knit community that we have is our Disparities Interest Group. Um, and again, it's uh, open to our members. It has over 800 individuals who are, um, participate in the Disparities Interest Group. And they focus very much on, they have a meeting linked to the main annual meeting. So those numbers on disparities abstracts I mentioned are separate from this part of the meeting. They have a, a separate half day meeting just on disparities abstracts. Um, and so the, the final two things I want to talk about is some of our, our work around really the development of the human capital to study and address health equity and disparities uh, through health services research. And so <clears throat> Academy Health has a number of activities where we look at the entire career trajectory from how many of you are students in the room? Okay, so you have some. So one of the things I was, um, I, we have student chapters in uh, schools across the country. Most of them are in schools of public health or colleges of medicine, but we do have one in a college of nursing um, and one in a college of pharmacy. And so I think you had one here and it went dormant, so we're going to reactivate that one. Um, but, uh, and we have a student memberships, but we also have an education council that helps us very much understand how are the career trajectories of health services research researchers changing. It used to be that you'd graduate with your degree, whether it was an MPH or a PhD, and wanted to do health services research. Your track, your option was academics. Now it could be lots of different things. And I'm sort of the poster child for not just working in academic settings. I mean, I've been a full professor in academic settings. I've worked in the state health department. I've worked in the federal government, work in the nonprofit sector. And we're seeing more and more health trained health services researchers now working in delivery systems, data analytics shops, the pharmaceutical industry, lots of places. So we're working with our leaders to really understand what are the competencies, and we're probably going to update the core competencies. What do people need? And as we think about updating the core competencies, obviously I'm very interested in thinking in that group who's going to do that, thinking about, well, what are the competencies around equity and understanding how to study equity that folks who are trained in our field need to have. We have a lot of scholarships and fellowships. Some of them are very targeted for diverse candidates, underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities in health services research with, in our field is no different than biomedical research. It's African American, Latino, and Native Americans are the underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities. And so we have a, um, an Academy Health um, uh, Fellowship for uh, URMs, that, uh, a scholarship to our meetings. We also have a partnership with the Aetna Foundation that provides additional opportunities. And we, um, we also have a population health scholars program that we do with support from the Kresge Foundation, where um, while that's not a, the underrepresented minorities is not a requirement, we work very actively to recruit a diverse set of candidates. And I would say of the 10 that we um, have each year, probably eight, seven to eight, are uh, underrepresented racial and ethnic minorities in health services research. Um, and we do a lot of other work on career development. Most recently, we became a partner on three out of the four human capital leadership programs that RWJ funded. One of them is at um, Hopkins, uh, Tom Lavise, who I'm sure you know, who's now at, at um, GW, is remaining the PI. But we work with three out of those four 
um, particularly in uh, the helping to get the word out and, and develop a really terrific pool of scholars, but also convening and working on the translation aspect. And then finally, we have a Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Minority Engagement in Health Services Research that focuses on these issues specifically. And we released a report in September of last year that we also uh, presented at the annual research meeting. And our board is taking this we're so thrilled so seriously. Not only did they establish the center two years ago, but we then met with this first product of the center's efforts. And we, we, they committed to a special board meeting and convened in October and doubled the budget for um, our efforts. And so we're doing a number of activities now to um, focus on the recommendations of that report. And we'll be reporting back at the annual research meeting every year on our progress. And in fact, one of the um, comments and recommendations was really, you know, the importance of, of, of elevating this issue in our messaging and our communications. And the opening plenary at the annual research meeting in Boston this year is a, uh, con the title is to be TBD because we're kind of refining it with the panelists, but it's really a conversation around race, ethnicity, and, and health and the role of research. And it's being moderated by Eduardo Sanchez, who's a, one of our board members. Um, from uh, American Heart Association. And we have um, uh, Joan Reed from Harvard speaking, and Paula Braverman, um, and Eliseo Perestable from NIMHD speaking. So, um, and that's the opening plenary for all 2,500 attendees. So I'm very excited about that. So to close, we have a few minutes left for conversation. But uh, the, the final point is there are a couple ways to be involved. But I think importantly, if we're going to move, if we're going to have health services research, inform and address achieving equity. You gotta have money for research, right? You gotta have the people who are funding this research have money and budget. So we um, partnered and established, we run friends groups, which are basically sort of advocacy groups for different federal agencies. We've historically done these for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and the National Center of Health Statistics. And just last year, we started one for the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. And so the Friends of, um, I, I assume you all know, but this is the mission statement for um, the Institute. And, um, and they're very focused, obviously, on uh, addressing what their mandate is, but also um, on diversity of the workforce as well. And the Friends, uh, we've been already working with uh, hosting Hill briefings and circulate and doing what advocates do, you know, circulating a letter saying, you guys got to fund this, you know, to Congress and what level of budget we want and sending people up and providing resource information. We just got a call from one of the committees saying, we saw Academy Health has a center for diversity. We want to hear more about what, how, how are you addressing diversity? So again, it's raising the visibility of these issues with members of Congress and their staff. Um, and obviously, we if you're not already an Academy Health member, we'd love to have you join our family. And if you're a student, it's only 40 bucks. If you're not a student, then it's more. But it's still one of the cheapest memberships. It's, it's actually right there with APHA. You know, we understand money is tight for everybody. Um, but there's lots that can be uh, achieved. And we'd love to have you uh, join us in addressing and achieving equity. Thank you. So we're being recorded, and so I want an opportunity for some questions. And what, I, what I'd like to do is, if you can take that off, I don't know how they put that on you. But that's, they need that for recording. Just stand here. Apparently. That way I can move around and I can actually hear the question. OK. Or you can uh, repeat the question. That's, that's another way. You can repeat the question. Would that work back there? Yeah, OK. She so doesn't want to talk. So you know, I'll go ahead and keep it with you. I think she's saying this is the one that's tied to the so okay. This. All right. So uh, the floor is open. Uh, uh, let, let me start. The um, New York Times reported that a successful intervention that came out of the diabetes prevention study uh, that proved that lifestyle could actually prevent the onset of type 2 diabetes better than medication. Yeah has now been approved for payment by Medicare. Can you speak uh, to that when prevention interventions then get actually sustained and funded through the largest insurer in the country? Well, I think it was really kind of a breakthrough moment, I think, um, and builds on other signals um, that certainly the Affordable Care Act started 
for example, that now if uh, an uh, a screening is deemed uh, grade A or B level evidence by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, then it's covered with first dollar coverage. In other words, you don't have to have a copay. It doesn't count towards you have to meet this much of your deductible before it's covered. So, so I think that there are both some policy changes that have been made, not enough, we have many more, that are um, using the evidence that our collective community is producing to say, we can align incentives, payment, and other to make sure that these effective interventions are available. So that's very positive, and I think the DPP has also been deployed in many other ways to the Ys and other ways to try to get it more widely used. Um, it's very encouraging, but I'm also sanguine about how far we still have to go to get prevention appropriately covered. Because often prevention is held to a standard of it must save money as opposed to it's just effective and saves outcomes. It improves outcomes and lives. And so bringing a cost dimension to the test of whether or not it's covered, um, it remains a very tough barrier. So, and also, it's not just with Medicare, but the Congressional Budget Office, with so much of prevention, you have a time issue that, um, you know, it might be, t and particularly in pediatrics, it might be 10, 20, 30 years before you see the benefit in disease outcomes or costs from uh, a condition that is preventable. And um, the uh, window for calculating benefit is much shorter for the Congressional Budget Office. So I, I think there are still many barriers to us further pushing prevention coverage at the national level. Where I also think it's exciting is though through innovations, whether it's through the state, uh, the SIM grants or other CMMI funded uh, innovations, but also the private sector as you start moving the dial towards paying for outcomes. Um, you know, the old thousand flowers will bloom. You know, people will see it in their best interest to focus more on prevention that helps keep people out of hospitals and um, hopefully prevents disease from establishing itself. Please, and introduce yourself. Joanna Dyer. Um, so a year ago, I published a paper with my PhD students on the preventive uh, services used among the uninsured. And we found that minorities were doing better than whites. And we didn't know why. I mean, we used full data from the MESH from 2004 to 2011. And we found that um, you know, the minorities are doing better than, than white people uh, among the uninsured. I was wondering if you have some explanation for that. Uh, no. What did you put in your discussion? <laughs> no, uh, and the question for purposes of the recording is why with your study in MEPS data that uninsured minorities have better use of preventive services than uninsured whites. Um, I don't know. I guess my mind goes to whether because of geography and the placement of safety net clinics who disproportionately serve um, persons of color that maybe persons of color who are, are uninsured are more likely to have access to free resources. I don't know. That's one hypothesis. That's one of the assumptions. We said that you know, it could be federally qualified health centers or right. you know, that was one of our, you know, but, but it was just puzzling. It is puzzling. Yeah. Hi, I'm Bob Gold. Uh, and I apologize for getting up and walking out at one point at a conflicting meeting. I was really thrilled to hear you talk about the 30th anniversary of the Heckler Report. I was in the Office of Disease Prevention Health Promotion at the time it was released, uh, and actually played, uh, did some writing in, in, in volume two as part of that, uh, along with many, many other people. But this is also the 30th anniversary of another big thing, coincidentally, the Ottawa Charter. Oh. Uh, and, and, uh, and WHO was making a big deal of this 30th anniversary anniversary of the Ottawa Charter internationally. I'm a little surprised that HHS hasn't done anything, but if it might, here's my question though. If Academy Health were in charge of this 30th year celebration, what would you want to see happen uh, to, to call out the achievements, the flaws, or other things related to this 30, 30 years? For the Heckler Report or the Ottawa Charter? For the Heckler, for the Heckler Report. Well, I, 
I think it would have been, uh, again, uh, an analysis of where progress has been made and where it has not. And maybe a sort of blue ribbon commission w of really respected leaders who could then say, given where we are today, what needs to happen? A roadmap for sort of a, a challenge for the future. Because while we have healthy people, 20 whatever we're on, Woody, what are we 2020. on? 2020, okay. Um, that report is so dense and so it's, it's hard to sort of have that as kind of a clarion call of focus. And I really would have loved to see that kind of very clear and, and emphatic statement about what needs to change to, to make more progress on black and minority health or to achieve health equity. Woody? Dr. Kessel. tell you the anecdotes, it was actually a Christmas party that she and I had a conversation, and it relates to the issue of um, she wasn't aware that there was a problem, to be blunt, and we happened to be standing next to one another, and um, <clears throat> I have the same bold gene that you do, and shared with her some of the issues I was working on around black-white disparities with infant mortality, but what it goes to, and I can go into detail about the rest of the story, but she was great. But the issue is, um, and I think you've talked about this, is the first job is to educate people about the disparity. But the one that you were zoning in on is on, and I think Stephen has talked about this too, the action-based research. So what is the level of detail that we need to actually move the needle forward. I mean, one of the things that I struggle with is at the population level, we see the disparities. But at the population level, it doesn't give us the level of detail to actually do the kind of intervention that's going to work for some and, frankly, not everybody, which has got to be an accepted principle. But what is the level of detail? What's the granularity? What other variables would you start to collect that are not really in the national data sets that keep helping us, you know, what's the problem, where's the problem, but not moving us toward what exactly do we do about it. Great questions. And, and I think these are ones that the field is really grappling with. So just a couple thoughts. One is I think we need to do a much better job of understanding what is the intervention is and describing the black box of, oh, we mount this intervention. Well, what does it really do when mounted and the importance and in doing that of mixed methods of not just quantitative data but also very important qualitative ethnographic data about what the intervention was and how it was deployed. Um, <clears throat> the other types of data and research that I think we that, and models we have to integrate into our studies much more is characterization of context. Because as you said, you know, we have to figure out what parts of the intervention, what pieces, because often these are multimodal and very complex interventions, what pieces are absolutely essential and which ones are context dependent and what is that context. So I don't know if folks are familiar with the, there are many frameworks on intervention research, but I, I start usually with the consolidated framework for intervention research that Laura Dam Schroeder and her colleagues did. And you know, characterizing the inner context, the outer context, again, using a theoretical framework to help organize your thinking about what do you need to capture information on as you study an intervention. Um, and then I think really, I think I would love to see much more investment by research organizations in that spread and scale studies because we're really good at doing single site studies. We evaluate programs to death in X location. And then we say, OK, they work. We've got the evidence. Let's fund it nationally. Well, wait. You know, the effect size, the fidelity, the adaptation. You need adaptation, but you want fidelity for your effect size. All that has to be monitored and evaluated as it's deployed. And one of the big issues, I think, that we have right now with evaluation research is that so much of it is appropriately funded by the federal government, but it's coming out of CMS and it's funded in ways that um, we're not getting the results out and we're, it's not very public 
It's contract research. And the investigators, the researchers, the evaluators have a lot of constraints on when and how they can share their results. And so I think we're, we're losing valuable time of learning for you know, the $10 billion that was given to CMMI. So I think that better methods, better data points, qualitative mixed methods, and more transparency and sharing of findings, even interim findings, I think would help us a lot. Now, before I, before I call the dean, let's give our speaker another hand. <laughs> and, and let me say that um, I think you'd be pleased to know that here in our Department of Health Services Research, we now have an MPH degree in health equity. Excellent. And uh, Dr. Francini and I and uh, some other colleagues just came back from a health equity summit organized by the Big Ten. So the Big Ten Conference is going to launch a major health equity initiative, and I think many of the things that you've talked about could help inform the kind of interventions that will take place across the 11 states of the Big Ten. Um, Dr. Uh, our Whatever Dean? Is Dean. <laughs> Clark? So thank you very much. I, I'd like to thank you for doing this. It's wonderful. I'm always happy to hear about people who study children. But uh, this is actually a little memento for thank you. But it's actually a pictorial history of the University of Maryland. So Excellent. you can come back, read this at home, and then come back again and check <laughs> us out. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. Thank